Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited and grateful to be here today to speak to you about a topic that I'm very passionate about, and that is menopause and women's health. My purpose here today is for you to rethink the way you think about the menopause. Oops, sorry. To, re to redirect and rethink the way you think about the midlife and menopause woman. Because we really need to stop defining menopause as a time of hot flashes, but rather think about it as a time of increased cardiometabolic risk. It's a significant time in a woman's life where her risk for chronic diseases significantly increases. So we're gonna talk about Sarah. Sarah is a 49-year-old um, executive, works full-time. She's a daughter of two teenage daughters. She is also a caregiver of an aging parent. She feels like she eats healthy. She eats salads all the time. She runs three times a week, so she exercises regularly. But over the past few years, she's noticed worsening fatigue. She's not sleeping well. She's agitated. She's irritated. But more frustrating to her is this 20 pound weight gain that she's had in the past two to three years. That's the reason why she wants to come see a doctor because she feels like she hasn't changed anything about her lifestyle, but yet she continues to gain weight and she doesn't understand why. So I think all of you know Sarah, you probably see her, you probably, <laughs> that's the number one reason why women come to the doctor. Why am I gaining weight? Why am I, you know, why am I overweight all of a sudden? Um, but it's a concern. And when she comes to see me, she's coming to me because of her symptoms. But there's definitely something more profound going on here on both a cellular and physiologic level. And if you check her labs and you check her vital signs, you start to see hints of this. We know that the menopause transition is a, a time of hormone change. But it's also a significant time. It's a, it's a time of a, a metabolic shift where women will see accelerated physiologic aging that men don't experience. And women feel this. They know that something has changed, something is different. So when they come to you for help, obviously you, you tell them, you know, you're in perimenopause. These are due to declining levels of estradiol. But we really need to look at what's going on deeper. So we know that the menopause transition affects every organ and system in the body, but I only have seven minutes. So <laughs> I'm gonna focus on um, the million dollar question that women always wanna talk about, and that's why am I gaining weight in menopause? And with all the interest in menopause and weight loss, you know, all the misinformation out on social media and on the internet, this is, I think a critical time for us as clinicians to really educate our patients with science-backed evidence-based solutions and answers, okay? I hope this is the right button. Okay, so, so why do women gain weight in menopause and, and perimenopause? So it's, it's this, this period of time. So perimenopause is a physiologic time where we have this increase in insulin resistance. It's this perfect storm of insulin resistance, and it happens on so many levels physiologically for a woman. And it all has to do with declining levels of estradiol, which happens in the menopause transition. So less, estradiol is so metabolically protective for women. So as this hormone starts to decline, we have a declining growth hormone. And we know that growth hormone is the main hormone that helps with um, maintaining and building muscle, maintaining and building bone. It gives us our energy, it gives us our vitality. So as estradiol declines, we see this drop in growth hormone. And because of that, women start to lose muscle mass. And muscle is so protective. And we do lose muscle mass as we age. That's part of the process of aging. And it actually happens after our 30th decade. So women in your 30s, you're, you're also <laughs> included in this, but we lose three to 8% statistically of our muscle mass per decade after age 30, but that accelerates for women when they go through the menopause transition. It goes up to five to 10% per decade after menopause if you're not doing anything proactive about it. So that loss of muscle mass affects our basal metabolic rate or our basal metabolism. 
um, which also makes us more susceptible to insulin resistance, okay? It takes a lot of energy to ovulate and menstruate. So when this ovulation process starts to become dysfunctional or absent, women lose 600 to 700 kilocalories a month. And that also affects our, our basal metabolic rate or our metabolism. We all know how important sleep is, right? So sleep is so important. Of course, classically, women in this period are, are not sleeping well. And when you don't sleep well, it affects your satiety hormones. Um, we make poor decisions. You know, we tend to reach for the ice cream instead of the fruit. We're too tired to exercise. But more importantly, sleep deprivation leads to increased physiologic cortisol. And as that cortisol goes up, you have increased gluconeogenesis in the liver. You get more blood sugar being made into the, the, um, the system, and therefore insulin resistance, once again, is a problem. Natural aging also increases physiologic cortisol. But lower estradiol levels in perimenopause also affect insulin receptor sensitivity. So you get decreased sensitivity at the, at the level of the receptor, so in the liver, in the muscle, in the adipose tissue. So this perfect storm of insulin resistance increases a woman's risk of hyperinsulinemia, which is the prodrome to prediabetes, and that insulin resistant really does promote fat mass production. So why does this matter? Oops, did I turn it off? Oops. There we go. So we talked about insulin resistance. We talked about that increased adiposity that women get, and this is android distribution of fat. And it's, once again, due to this declining level of estradiol. But what else does estradiol do for us? Estradiol is so protective in our arteries. So estradiol protects our glycocalyx and the endothelium. It helps with elasticity in, in the arteries. It helps with nitric oxide production. So when we lose estradiol, this is when we start to see blood pressure come up. This is when women start presenting with prehypertension and hypertension. In addition to um, estradiol's function, it also plays a role in cholesterol metabolism. So with impaired cholesterol metabolism, this is when the LDL starts to go up, HDL starts to go down. With insulin resistance, we start to see triglycerides go up. So estradiol is so protective here. And if you look at these four biomarkers, these are the four biomarkers that we use to diagnose metabolic syndrome, right? All four of these biomarkers physiologically go up in menopause and perimenopause transition. For, for most women, not all, but definitely for a majority of women. Not every single one, but at least two to three, you'll see something going on here. And what do we know about metabolic syndrome? We know that metabolic syndrome is a risk-enhancing factor for ASCVD. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. ASCVD is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality for women in the world, right? It's the leading cause of death for women here in the United States. One out of two women will succumb to cardiovascular disease in their lifetime. And women are nine times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than they are of breast cancer. So this is a critical period for primary prevention of ASCVD for women. And women are, are they know they don't feel well. So I definitely think at this time, this is when they're really receptive to treatment. I mean, they, you know, you, I know you primary care doctors have been telling them for years you know, that this is abnormal, that this is what you need to do. But I think at this stage, women are ready. Women are ready to take charge of their health and feel better. Um, I, Dr. Sheba, uh, Dr. Mosin's gonna talk about all the treatment and answers, but I did wanna bring up this study that came out in menopause last year. This was a small retrospective cohort study of 106 women done at the uh, Mayo, Mayo Health Clinic. And what it looked at was postmenopausal obese women on semiglutide therapy um, with and without hormone replacement therapy. And what the study found was that these women um, who were obese, BMIs were greater than 27, when um, they took semiglutide with hormone replacement therapy, they actually had a 30% more uh, weight loss than women that were on semiglutide therapy alone. So does estradiol or estrogen enhance GLP-1 efficacy? 
maybe. So this was a very small study, so obviously larger clinical trials need to be done, but I think this is, this is very interesting, and, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about this. So my take-home message to you today um, is we need to think about the midlife woman as a whole patient because menopause is not just about hormone replacement therapy and hot flashes. It's about a, a period of time of increased cardiometabolic risk. Um, it's a critical time that we can impact a woman's life on primary prevention of ASCVD and other chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, because how a woman lives the first half of her life impacts her morbidity and mortality of the last half of her life. Thank you. All right. So let's come back to our friend Sarah. Ooh, Sarah. Sarah, who is menopausal, 49 year old, she's struggling with weight. She's struggling with other um, symptoms of menopause, heart, heart flashes. She's frustrated. And what? Um, can I go? Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. So Sarah is trying. She's trying really hard, as Dr. Mandela pointed out. She's, she's exercising. She's eating well. She's trying, but she's not progressing. She's, she's upset about that. So Sarah is not alone. About 60% of women going through menopause would experience some form of uh, menopausal symptoms, including um, weight gain. And the physiology of weight gain in menopause is not as simple as estrogen goes down, you, you increase visceral fat. But the important thing to know is that there is a lot of other neurohormonal things going on in the body that causes the weight gain, the increase in visceral fat. As Dr. Modella pointed out, high risk of metabolic syndrome and weight gain, insulin resistance, ghrelin and leptin, these are hormones that signal satiety and, and um, hunger. These change, reduce muscle mass. All of these changes are occurring in Sarah's body right now. So what do we do to help her? Of course, nutrition and movement are the foundation of any weight loss, not just weight loss in a menopausal woman. Uh, but it's not the finish line. Here's the kicker, it's not enough. Only three to 5% of, of weight loss can be achieved, according to latest studies, with just nutrition and, and, and diet and uh, exercise in menopausal women. So behavioral therapy and mindful eating, that's also has been shown, uh, has shown promise, but again, not enough. So what do we do to help us? This is what I was talking about, 3 to 5% average weight loss. What actually works? So let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? Things that are always talked about, either in a good way, bad way. There's so much drama around it, but also so much hope for the doctors and for the practitioners who are trying to help uh, patients to lose weight who've been trying themselves with nutrition and diet. Um, these medications like semaglutide or Wegovy or terzepatide or uh, Zebbound, these, are the, these act on actual neurohormonal pathways that I was talking about. They work on GLP-1 and GLP-1, GIP-1 receptors. These are the signals um, that control hunger, satiety, gastric emptying. And in turn, it leads to um, weight loss and um, we suggest that they do it and uh, in conjunction with weight training and not just so the common things, myths that are associated with it, I'll talk about it, but these are game changers. These medications uh, have shown to have 15 to 20% of average weight loss. That's, that's significant compared to the three to 5%, right? So, myths about anti-obesity medication. So Sarah comes in, women like Sarah come in, they're like feeling ashamed about seeking medical attention or, medic or 
medications for their weight loss. And the myths, they should, they'll come in whispering, but I heard you're gonna gain all the weight back once you stop taking it. Or aren't these medications for diabetic patients only? And, or they'll say, what are the long-term effects of me taking these medications? So let's be clear that obesity is a chronic illness. It is, it's not just eat less, work out more. It is a chronic illness, and like any other chronic illness, hypertension, diabetes, depression, we have to address it constantly, continuously, monitor it, and medications may be needed on a chronic basis in order to control it. So what should we stop doing? We should stop pretending that eat less, move more is enough. We should stop shaming women for seeking treatment. We should accept that obesity is, uh, in menopause, is at its neurohormonal level a chronic disease. And we should stop blaming patients for gaining weight. That's what we see the most uh, in patients who are coming in, women like Sarah, who, who think like that. We have to change that. Instead, we should validate engage and empower women. Sarah is not alone. She's not an exception. She is the norm. She comes to us with hope, and that's what we can do for her. I think most of us have been in the doctor's seat talking to Sarah, but now to my message to all those doctors is validate, engage, and empower. She did not need to just eat less and work out more. She needed a real strategic plan with her doctor, uh, something that was grounded in compassion and science. And I think once we do that, we unlock not just weight loss or fat loss, we unlock the opportunity for Sarah to achieve a better health and a better outcome and a better mind. Thank you.